All right, we are going to rewind a little bit here. Um, and I can delay, I, I posted a new assignment over the weekend, but I can postpone that because I want everyone to get um, up to and including assignment seven and really nail it and make sure that it's perfect. All right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there, there's a few people uh, that, you know, a lot of people that turned it in, um, you know, I had comments on their assignment. Um, and again, I'm a believer in, in reworking it. You know, they, they, they say, you know, they say, what do they say? They say a lot of stuff, right? But <laughs> they say that you learn from your mistakes. Well, you can learn from your mistakes. But, you know, if, if you automatically learn from your mistakes, then the Cleveland Browns would be heading towards the Super Bowl this year, right? So you don't always learn from your mistakes. You have the potential to learn from your mistakes. Um, and that's why I, I, I like to give do-overs, you know. It's like, let's, let's do, you know, let's, let's take some time for those of you that turned it in. So if you didn't get full credit uh, for it, um, I want you to talk with me and make sure you understand the issue and then rework it. Now, we'll handle some of the stuff in class today, and then some of the stuff will probably go early to lab, assuming the lab is open, which I think it is during this time. So I probably won't have a full lecture today, but we'll go so far and we'll work on it. And then we'll see how it goes for Thursday. All right? But I want to make sure we get this down and get this down right. There, there's a handful of things that I want to cover, all right, today in class before we go to lab. Let me write them down so I don't forget them. One is the database design. Two is the connection string. Three is to sketch out how Lab 7 ought to work. All right. And along the way, if you have questions, we can we can address those as well. Um, but but that's what I plan on doing today. And then if that ends, um, if that ends, um, then then uh, we'll adjourn to lab. All right. First of all, database design. Let me pull up the description of the database. And I'm not going to display it on the screen. I'm just going to, I just want to, want it so that I don't misstate something. One thing I urge you, by the way, I, I typically say this, but um, just to reiterate, if you have problems or questions, you know, lab is the best time to, to ask. Um, other than lab, though, uh, please send me an email. And the one thing that I would like you to do is if you have a question, don't, like, put it in when you upload your assignment. All right? Because I grade things when I have time to grade them, but I answer my email pretty much every day. I mean, there might be a day or two that I have let slide because um, of other stuff. But generally speaking, I'm pretty well caught up on my email. So if you have a question, don't simply upload it and say, well, this is what I tried and it didn't work. You know, email it to me and say, this is what I tried, and, and you'll get an answer quicker. So anyhow, let's look at lab seven and look at the database. A few things, if you're reading a narrative or if someone's explaining to you a problem for which you're designing a database, a few things to keep in mind. That what you're looking for and what's relevant and anything they say could point to one of these sort of three things. They could be describing an entity, they could be describing an attribute, 
or they could be describing a relationship among entities. All right, so let's take a minute to review the database design for this. And seven, but the database was defined in lab six, I think. All right. Classes have a class code, a name, a department, and a number of credit hours. What piece of information, what pieces of information do we get from that statement? Two. 
and I'm going to use that to link these tables together. I'm going to use that as a unique identifier. But class code would also work, that is CISS 243, because there's only one CISS 243 on campus, just as there's only one class 5. All right? Okay. So that's the class. That's what we get from the first rule that we read. The second rule that we read, that, that we have here, is each class can have multiple sections. Each section is taught by one professor. Okay? What do we get from that? We need a table of professors. All right. One thing we get is that we need a table of professors. Um, especially knowing what we know about professors, right? Let me rephrase that. <laughs> Realizing that professors could have a set of attributes associated with them, all right? That indicates that it's an entity as opposed to just a plain old attribute, all right? In other words, for a professor, we're going to have the name, we're going to have where their office is, telephone number, email, and all that. So, professors... We're going to have a professor ID. It's going to be the primary key. Name, first name, last name, um, email address, office, etc. We haven't really described uh, what is in the professor table, but we know that there could be these things. This is where your job as a database designer would be to ask, well, what do we need to know about each professor? And then you would ask the person that you're working with. Again, and you would ask a variety of people. You wouldn't simply base your database design on the interview with one person, right? Because for some people, there's some things that are important. For other people, there's other things that are important, all right? Uh, the vice president's office might need a department number so that they could prepare budgets and know how much, you know, how much the budget is for each division. All right. The administrative assistants might need to know the office hours for a professor. All right. The VP probably doesn't care about the office hours, right? If you're, if, if she wants to have a meeting with you, she's gonna have a meeting with you. Doesn't matter when your office hours are, right? Whereas a administrative assistant that takes phone calls from students and say, well, do you know when? Zeller's going to be in his office, they would probably need to know that. So it pays to talk to a variety of different people to get their views on this. Okay, so one thing that we got from this is that there's a professor entity. What else did we get? Each class could have many sections. Each section is taught by one professor. <coughs> we need to do something with sections. All right. Now, let's consider the, act, the, the, the possibilities, all right? Could we put the section information in the class table? Yes. Yes. That's what I did. Okay. You, you won't have anything. Let, let, let me. Okay. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. Your class ID won't, won't be unique anymore because you'll have a class and a section. They might have more sections for one class. Okay. The key word in that set statement is that each class can have multiple sections. Okay. So, if we were to put a section here, like maybe a section number, maybe the hours that it meets, the days that it meets, and so on, we got a, we got a few problems. All right. <clears throat> few potential problems depending on which way we go. All right. One thing that, one problem that we could have is if we do this, how do we account for multiple sections for this class? All right. This class only has one section, but like CISS 121, there's a whole bunch of sections for it. All right. So if we do this, how do we account for multiple sections? Well, one way to do that would be to put a section ID as part of the primary key here. That's not a good idea because then we're going to have redundant information. 
All right? In other words, if there were a second section of this class, how many credit hours would it be? It would also be four. What would the course code be for it? It would also be CISS 243. What would the name of the course be? It would also be web database integration. What's the description? Same. The same. All right? So, if we made this table contain both class and section information, we got a problem. All right? Because we have duplicated data. Let's say we change from ASP.NET to ASP.NET++. Plus plus. All right? We would have to go and find every section of <coughs> CISS 243 and make that change. All right? Which isn't good. Redundant data. The whole purpose of a database is that one particular field of data is only recorded in one place. So if this contains a mix of section and class information, that's not correct because some of the information is only, how do I want to say it, is only dependent on the class that you're talking about. And some of the information is depending on the class and section that you're talking about. And in database terms, that's a no-go. All right? The fields in the table should depend only on the primary key. All right? So therefore, we don't want any section information in here all right, because there's more than one section, and we can't have section one, two, three, and so on, because how many sections for the most number of sections? There's probably some English courses that there's a whole bunch of sections for, right, where there's some other classes that there's only one. And we can't combine them in the primary key because then pieces of this data would only depend on part of the primary key. So that's also a no-go. So. Section may, belongs in its own entity. All right? Section belongs in its own entity. What was the tip off in the wording? The phrase class has multiple. All right? Associated with the class is more than one. So you got these things called classes, and they're related to these things called sections. And they're related in a one-to-many, um, the, the cardinality is called, of the relationship is one-to-many. Now, how do we know it's one-to-many? Well, the statement says one class has many sections. All right? But we've got to look the other direction, too. And, again, if you were at all in doubt, you could ask. All right? But it doesn't make sense that one section, in other words, like our class in here today, the section of CISS 243, half of you are in CISS 243, half of you are in CISS 160. That doesn't make sense, right? When we meet in a classroom, we're all for the same class. So a given section of a class is associated with only one class. Now. Again, part of the confusion of this could be the fact that class can be used a couple different ways, right? In other words, when I'm talking about a class, I could be talking about this as being a class, and when I'm talking about CISS 243, I could be calling that a course, you know, this, that there are several classes for a given course or several sections for a given course or whatever. That's why it's important to get your terminology down and define it a certain way. All right? And again, when in doubt, ask. If someone starts talking about, in database terms, that, well, a class has many students in it, ask them, do you mean this is a class or are you really talking about a section? All right. Now, we know something else about the section. We know the relationship it has with the professor. And again, one professor teaches how many sections? Many. many. A given section has how many professors? 
just one. All right. I don't think there's any tag team teaching here at campus. If there is, we're going to pretend there isn't. All right. Now, what would be in a section table? Well, we need a code. We could generate a surrogate key of section ID. What else do we need in this table? At the very least. The class ID. The hours that it meets, that's true. The days that it meets. What else do we need? Professor ID. Now, this is something that's like mechanical, all right? This particular relationship requires no judgment at all, all right? We see there's a one-to-many between professor and section. What does that mean? It means that the primary key in this table is a foreign key in this table because a section has to point to the one professor that is teaching that section. <clears throat> I would make the fields the same name, all right? That's not an absolute requirement, but I think it's a good practice. That really makes it clear that this professor ID matches up with that professor ID. Same thing with class and section. A class has many sections, therefore the class ID is a foreign key in the section table to point up to the one class. Again, the many side always points to the one because the many side can all point to the one class that it belongs to or professor that it belongs to. Whereas the professor can't point to multiple sections. All right, again, we run into the multiple problem um, and so on. So it doesn't matter. I mean, if you, if, if you were doing database design in Klingon, all right, and you add two tables like this, and I'll just make some symbols here. I don't know if this is actual Klingon or not. <laughs> I hope I didn't like swear or something. You know, I'll get emails like, "How dare you say that in class?" All right? We know this. We don't need to know what these tables are, right? The key of this table, so, hope I'm spelling this right, ID is going to match up to this table, all right? So it doesn't matter what the tables are. If there's a one-to-many relationship between the two tables, then the key of one, the one that's on the many side, points to the primary key on the one side. So that's a take it to the bank mechanical thing that you can just count on. When you have a one to many relationship, the table on the many side of the one relation one to many relationship will have as an attribute the primary key of the one side of it. What's that second Class ID? Yeah. It's class ID. Okay, just making sure. Yeah. So, again, we know that section's an entity because we say that that guy has, a, the classes have a multiple of them, right? That's a tip off. Multiple means it can't be an attribute because you don't have an attribute repeated at a table. All right. Why not? For all the reasons we talked about before. How many sections would we put in? You know, do we put five sections in? Well, again, there might be some classes that have more than five. You don't know. So, database terms, zero, one, many. All right? Now, here's a question for you. We'll throw a curveball here. All right? Relationship between professor and class is one to many. Is 
It's actually many to him. Right. Now, good job. Do we do we put something in here for that? They could, or they could teach different sections of different classes, right? So a professor wouldn't necessarily be related to a particular class, and a particular class wouldn't that necessarily be related to. Well, again, there is a many-to-many -many relationship between professor and class ID. In other words, one professor can teach many classes. I teach CISS 243, I teach CISS 265, and so on. And one class can have many professors. CISS 121 is taught by Gresh, it's taught by uh, Barry, it's taught by other people. All right. Here's and again, I don't I don't want to steer you off course, but you actually don't implement that relationship. All right. So you don't do anything in the database for that. Why not? Why don't we need this? Because they're already connected via the section. In other words, the relationship between professor and class already is implemented via the section table. And I can derive that relationship by going through the section table. In other words, what does it mean to teach a class? It means that you have a section of it, right? Why do I say that I teach CISS 243? Because I'm associated with a section of CISS 243. All right? So really, if I drew that many-to-many -many relationship, that would be this table. All right? So be careful with derived relationships. We'll see the same thing between, for example, student and professor. All right? You could say, well, there's a many-to-many -many relationship between student and professor. And there is. One professor has many students. Each student can have many professors. But that's already, that relationship already exists through the section. All right? So you would not need to implement that relationship. All right. Each professor store first name, last name, and department. What do we get from that? Well, <laughs> that we store first name, last name, and department. Do we get anything else from that line? Does the department needs its own table. Why does department need its own table? Repeat that, please. And. No, yeah, in a way there is, but in a way not really. I mean, there's maybe seven divisions on campus, academic divisions. You get multiple classes in the same department. Professors too. Yeah, the professor has one department. He has multiple departments. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't I just have a text field in there? Why don't I just have a text field where you type in the name of the department? All right. Because it's a section and class is going to be tied up in the This class is by this okay. professor. Probably the class has a department as well, not necessarily the section, right? Because, okay. like, some of CISS 243 isn't going to be in, engin you know, in engineering and the rest be in, in social sciences, right? So it will be the class. Now, you made a good point. There's other information about the department. That's one sign that department is an entity. The fact that if you think about it, and again, if you're not sure, ask. Um, there's more than the department than just a name, right? There's where the department's office is. There's the dean of the department. There's employees associated with that department. So department is more than simply an attribute like email address. Email address is just a string of characters. Right? Doesn't really connect to anything. Um, there's not other information about the email address, so therefore it's just a plain old attribute. But with the department, we could easily see that in addition to just having the department name, we would want other information. Um, I've heard it said, and this is one of the best 
sayings about software development is the two biggest mistakes in developing software, the first one is not listening to what the user says. All right, ignoring what the user says. The second problem is listening to what the user says. <laughs> All right. What does that mean? That means take it with a grain of salt. Ask questions. All right, when in doubt. You're the one that knows the database rules and the rules of normalization and why we do these things. All right? Hopefully. Hopefully. Right. So if they say, no, we need a department name for the person, don't be afraid to ask the question and say, really? You know, do, does the department have, you know, um, an office? Does the department have a dean? Oh, yeah, it, it has all those things. Well, that tells you it has attributes. All right? There's another reason besides the fact that a department has attributes that we would want to make it in a separate table. All right? Let's think of if we didn't put it in its own table. What if we did not put what if we did not put the department in its own table and it was just a free-form text string? What would we run into? Spelling mistakes. Spelling mistakes or abbreviate differences in abbreviation. In general, lack of consistency. So, for example, I belong to the Engineering, Business, and Information Technology Division. Wow. How many different ways do you think you could mess that up? All right. Someone could type EBIT, e e Engineering Business Information Technology. Someone could type in Engineering Business and IT. Someone could type in Engineering Business and Infotech. You know, I mean, not to mention the fact that maybe you spell engineering wrong, you know, or business or, or whatever. So we want to ensure consistency. And we want to ensure, and we want to build this on a database level. In other words, we don't want to write validation in all our programs to make sure that they've spelled that word right. We want to ensure at the database level that our data has integrity. That we don't assign someone to the, um, you know, to the, um, what would be a ridiculous department, um, to the, um, posting gifts to Facebook department, all right? Which is what I was doing before class. That's why it's, it's on my mind, all right? Because there's no such thing as that, right? There's seven departments. Could there ever be more or less than seven departments? Absolutely. They could. There could be a field that takes off, and all of a sudden they add a division for some new field, all right? Or they could consolidate. Like they moved the business and information technology in with engineering. So they could adjust that, but at one point in time, those are the only choices for department. And we want to make sure that we constrain the data to only being one of the valid choices. What does that mean in database terms? That means that you have a foreign key relationship. So I'm going to have a department ID that this guy's a foreign key to, and then there's going to be other stuff here, the name, the office, and so on down the line. By establishing that foreign key, I can't force in bad data, no matter how I try. All right? That's why, if possible, you build the constraints on the database level. All right? You could say, hey, you know, I don't want to get into this database stuff. I won't make a foreign key, but I'll just make sure my program makes sure that is one of these five choices. Well, okay, even if you got that to work, what happens if the rules of the database change? And what happens if someone else writes another program after you've been promoted to director of IT and they are not as good at validation as you are and so on and so forth? Then you're going to end up with a mess. Whereas if you build a constraint in the database 
And by building a constraint, I mean creating a relationship and check the little box that says enforce referential integrity. If you do that, then that constraint is built on the database level. And it doesn't matter how you try to get the bad data in, the database will prevent it from getting put into the table. All right. For each student store first name and last name, well, that one's probably as straightforward. as anything. We have a student, which we know is an entity. How do we know it's an entity? Well, because it has multiple attributes. And we want a student ID to identify it. Primary key, first name, last name. Finally, each student may be enrolled in several class sections. All right. And then finally, I mentioned you don't need to worry about different semesters. Okay. What that does is that allows you to assume that a student is only in a class one time. All right. So that, that gives you the ability to do that. So, students can be enrolled in several class sections. What does that tell us? There's a relationship between student and section. There's a relationship between student and section. And what's the cardinality? One student can be in how many sections? Many. Do we leave it there? No, we've got to look in the other direction here. And now I didn't say it, but simply by looking around the room, all right, and your basic experience, and again, when in doubt, ask, can one section have more than one student? Well, of course. You know, this isn't private tutoring where everyone has their own class and all that. So really, there's a many-to-many -many relationship between those two. Now, in database terms, that cannot stand, all right? Can't end the database design and still have a many-to-many -many relationship. If you're just sketching it out and thinking about it, okay, it's not like someone's going to come in and arrest me for having a many-to-many -many relationship drawn up here. But when I go to implement that relationship, I can't leave it like that. So what do I do in the case of um, the relationship between student and section? An intersecting table. And we can call that, usually, if you don't have a better idea, you can call it the names of the two tables. So it's student section table. So every time we have many to many, we put an intersecting table. Right. Now the details of that intersecting table can be a little different in some cases. Like, for example, in this case, I said that a, we're only talking one semester, so a student can only be enrolled in one section of the class. So I could literally make this student ID and section ID. And those things together could be the primary key. Again, let's put some data here. One is Charlie. Two is Marilyn. All right. Three is David. Course. Course one is CISS 243. Course two can be CISS 216. Course 3 can be CISS 143. Section ID. Section ID 1 can be for CISS 243. 
So this is a section ID. This is a class ID. <coughs> Section 2 can also be CISS 243. Section 3 can be for CISS 216. Section 4 can be CISS 143. Again, then would po point to the professor and department. We'll not show data there because I want to show the data here. So let's say that Charlie and Marilyn are in this section of CISS 243. So what would you have? Well, you'd have Charlie's ID in the student ID and section one in the section ID. Marilyn is also in section one. Let's say David is in section two of CISS 243. And we'd have David is in section two. And then let's say David is also taking CISS 216. So David is taking the section associated with CISS 216. Yes? Um, for a student section table, do we have two primary keys? You, right, you have a, what's called a composite primary key. Oh, okay. In other words, if you look at this, we couldn't make either part of them by, the, by itself the primary key. We couldn't make the student number the primary key because then we couldn't have a student take more than one class. So if just the student number was primary key, then that situation wouldn't be possible for two classes for student number three. If just the section number was primary key, then we couldn't accommodate for more than one student in the section. All right, and that's clearly wrong as well. Now, the combination of it, that's legit, right? Because, again, doesn't matter how much you enjoy this class, you're not going to enroll in this section twice. All right, once is enough. All right, so therefore, the combination of student and section is what is unique. Yes? What happens when, say, Marilyn signs up for section one, which is class 243, and section two, which is That's a good point. In other words, this would allow someone to sign up for both the day and evening section of a course. All right? That's something that I do not believe you could address on the database level. You would have to have other controls in your system to prevent that from happening. Um, the database would allow it. All right? Remember, there's, you know, Constraints are either implemented within the database or they're implemented within the application. All right? Now, the better place to put the constraint is in the database because then any application that uses a database has to follow that constraint. All right? However, in some cases, if you can't design a database to implement a particular constraint, then you revert to, well, that would be a rule we'd have to build into our code. So that's an excellent point, but um, that, that's how it would be addressed. Now, one of the things that is important to do when you're sort of shaking this out is like, the old, can we get there from here, like on a map, you know. So, if I wanted to know every student in CISS 243, could I get that? Could I get every student that's in CISS 243? How would I get that? Just describe it. You don't have to, like, write the SQL statement. Okay, well, you'd get the class ID out of the class table. You'd look for all the sections for that class ID. For each of the sections, you would look for all the student section rows for that section. 
And then for that, you would look up to the student to get the student name. So in database terms, that would be a select between four tables. Select first name, last name, from class, section, student section, student, where class code equals CISS 243. And class class ID equals section class ID. And section section ID equals student section section ID. And student section student ID equals student student ID. And that's how we get that. Alright? So it's like you know, it's like um, like directions on a map, you know, how you get from here to there. And how do we do that? We traverse that via the foreign keys, because the foreign keys are what connect tables together. And that's the only way that you're ever going to connect two tables together, is via their, their foreign key. All right, Zellers is sick today. He isn't really, but let's say Zellers is sick. Hope you get better soon. Thank you. You're welcome. And we want to call every student that Zellers has to tell them that Zellers classes are canceled. How would we do that? Let's describe how we would do that. Pardon me? Yeah, we have. Let's assume we have a phone number in the student table. <laughs> Professor ID from Zellers. You look at the section table. You'd probably filter for day of the week, right? Because if I'm sick today, that doesn't mean my Monday and Wednesday classes are going to be canceled. So you would further, so, so you know, select uh, Professor I, you know, select a bunch of stuff, student, first name, last name, phone number, from professor section, student section, student, where Professor, professor ID equals Zeller's professor ID. And section professor ID equals professor professor ID. And days met equal Tuesday. And section, section ID equals student section section ID. And student student ID equals student section. All right. So it's useful to play these scenarios out. And again, where do you get these scenarios? You know, that should be part of the requirements of the application. In this particular case, I just defined rules for the database. But a database is seen within the context of some application. And therefore, you would have a list of requirements of what your application would need to be able to do. All right. Question on the student section table. Would we put the student's phone number there? No, it's in the student. Why not in the students? Why not in the student section table? It'd be repetitive. So. A student's phone number, for example, David's phone number would be in the student section table twice. So David gets a new phone, well, you have to change it in two places. You have to change it in two places, you run the risk of it being inconsistent. Another way to put that is the student phone number is associated with just the student. It does not depend on the, the, the section that, you're, that a student is enrolled in only depends on what student you're talking about. You tell me the student, I'll tell you the phone number. I don't need to know which class you're talking about. What's an example of an attribute other than the student ID and section ID that might be in that section student table? 
What is something that depends on the combination of student and section? Pardon me? No, because for one thing, you would not want to have that count on each individual student. In other words, you're enrolled in CISS 243, the count is 16. He's enrolled in CISS 243, the count is 16. In fact, you don't even really want to store the count anywhere. Why not? You can figure it out. Again, it's derivable. So if you can figure out something from the database, there's no need to store it. So, if I want to know how many people were in a section, what I'd do? I'd use an aggregate function to say, select count from student section, section, where section ID equals something and blah, 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 blah. I'd use an aggregate function. So what might be in the student section table? What's true about the combination of you and this class? Pardon me? Well, that's not distinct to you, though, in this class. That's distinct to the section itself. A grade. Your final grade or your midterm grade or the attendance that we mark at week two, whether you've ever attended or not or whatever. The grade's a good example, though, because that depends on the combination of you and the class. All right, not everyone in the class gets the same grade, and you don't get the same grade in every class. So if I ask you, what was your grade, I can't ask that to the class. I have to ask that to an individual student, and I have to ask them that about a specific class that they're enrolled in, a specific section. All right. Next thing I want to do real quick, are there any questions about this before we go on? I hope this clears up some of the issues that people had. One of the things to remember, again, it's where I've defined a foreign key. You must go into Access, if that's what you're using, and establish a relationship and say that you want to enforce referential integrity. Simply having two columns called student ID in, in two different tables doesn't cut it. All right, let's do the connection string again. And I do apologize. I might have been the source of some of the confusion here because I made a mistake when I did this, so I do apologize for that. But let's make a, just a little tiny database that has a couple of fields in it. And let's make a brand new app that does that. So I'm going to make a new access database. Go in here and add a couple fields, or add a table on a couple fields. I'm going to go into design view. I will call this professor. For lack of anything better. I typically call the primary key the name of the table plus ID. All right, that's all we'll do for now. And then we'll save this and put in a couple of people.
we'll go and say file new website put it on the desktop empty website put it on the desktop and call it example doesn't exist? Of course it doesn't exist. Do I want to make it? Sure. So now it makes it and all it has is the web config file in it. Now again, whenever I refer to the apps folder, I'm talking about the folder that contains web config. I have some people on occasion like give me like the solution file and all that by itself and I'll say give me the app folder. So the easiest way to do this is to put everything in the folder that the web config file is. So we'll put our files, we'll put our classes if we have any, we'll put our databases here. Now the database I want to put in a special folder called app data, app underscore data. So I'll move my database on over into there. All right, and I can hit refresh. Maybe. folder and now I see the app data with it in there and I can even double click on it and look at it if I need to so I can see the tables that are in here see the fields see the data all right so now I'm going to go and possible to do what? Where we're doing here using access and data? Absolutely. Oh, okay. What do you mean ASP? You can use ASP with Python and with Java. I think with Java, can you? You know how we do web design, <coughs> this whole class using C sharp? Yes. Can we use, do the same thing using Java? Yes. Okay. I know some people use Python. Totally can't find. I'll create a file. First thing, I, I, I say this almost every class, but I'm going to repeat some things that how I want every one of your applications to look from now on. I want them first of all to look like a finished application and not just like the examples I do in class. 
The examples I do in class, I do because we're focusing on specific things. I'm not making a claim that what I'm doing is a great uh, application. So therefore, all right, if you were doing this, you would want to remember what we talked about a few weeks back and make a master page, okay? Because we're, chances are we're going to have, we're going to add to this uh, example, and therefore you want your pages to look consistent. And then you want a navigation between those pages, all right? So I don't have to, like, guess what your pages are called, all right? I can just click and go from one page to another, all right? Think, look at your application as though it was something you were actually using for something, all right? So, like, take a step back and, and look at it from a user's perspective and say, would this make sense if I was a user and I saw this screen in front of me? How would I know how to get from here to here? So, for example, in, in this case, in, in the case of Lab 7, you um, need to make a, uh, a search by department and a search by class name. Well, that's two pages, right? So, have a navigation so I can easily switch between those pages, all right? That's what you would expect if you were going to that site, you know? So, go and do that. Now, your first page should be called what? default.aspx because by default that's like the home page of your application is default.aspx so they even give you a hint by calling it that the first page that you create default all right so make your home page default.aspx all right then if you have other pages you can give them descriptive names don't make it default 2 and default 3 but make it a descriptive name again Take like the extra two minutes to do a good job instead of just rushing through to have something completed. Okay, so I'll go and I'll do this. Hit add. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a database connection. So I'm going to go down here and say that I want a SQL data source. And I click to configure it. Now, this is our absolute first time in this database, right? So we have to make a new connection. All right. So I'm going to click new connection. It's a Microsoft Access Database. Where's the file? I'm browsing for it. And already I'm getting into trouble. Because watch what happens. There's no password or anything. OK. Do you want to save it? Yes, you do. All right. You want to save it because you only want to do this once. One database means one connection string. That's not to say that there are not applications for which there are multiple database connections, but we're not writing any, at least not at this point. So we want to save that so we can use that for every subsequent database connection. All right. Next. Then I specify what I want, and so on, test the query, I can then put a grid view on here, and select my data source, and run it, and I'm okay. Away we go. All right. 
looks good. Now, let's say you upload that. And I download it onto my machine. We're going to pretend that I've done that. And we're going to simulate that by making a folder called Zeller's Machine. So now I'm on my machine. So I go and open Visual Studio. It should work on my machine like it worked on yours. Because when you develop, you develop using your test server and all that. At some point, you're going to port it to a real live server. And you want to make sure it's still working then. So I go into File, Open, Website. I navigate to that folder and open it. And I click Run and drum roll, please. It works. Actually surprised that it worked. I was I was trying to break it. See, that, that just shows you how good I am. I even try to make a mistake and I can't. All right. Why did that work? Let's look at the web config file. <clears throat> that worked because my data source includes data directory. All right. In other words, what is data directory? That is where the .NET framework expects you to put your database. In our case, and by default, is app underscore data. Okay? So, that's where it expects the data to be. So, if I move this to my machine, it's still in my app data folder because that's not a hard-coded path. If you see in there, C colon blah, 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 that's something specific to your machine, it won't work when I move it to my machine. All right? So, way to test to see if it will work would be to move your folder from one place to another on your own machine, and if it still works, then it will work more than likely when I download it. All right. Another way to do it is to visually look and see the data directory is that way. Now let me try to do it wrong so I can show you the symptom of that. So let's go in here. Let me delete that guy. And let me create a new one. keeps creating it with a data directory. So I'm not even sure how to create it incorrectly. I remember the first time we did it. We first time we did it, we, we did it wrong. Yeah, I do remember that, but I'm not even sure. But you can preview it like that. And if you did it wrong, that's okay. You can fix it. You can fix it provided that you said to save it in the web config file, and you simply replace the hard-coded path with this pipe data directory pipe, and then make sure that your database is in the app underscore data folder. I can help you out with this if you're having trouble. It's one of those things that like once you get it down, then you don't worry about it anymore. All right, I want to spend a couple minutes. I'm going, I know I'm going over a little bit, but I will make up for this by having Thursday and all work day.
providing that the lab is available. All right. Um, so look at the specifications for lab seven and see what my expectations were. It's always this way. When I say like, oh, I probably won't go the full time, that usually means I'm only going to go 10 minutes over the deadline instead of like a half hour over or something. I always say that I give you more than your money's worth. I, I want you to put that on your evaluation. <laughs> I'll be sure I right that. Yeah. Once he starts dropping knowledge, he can't stop. <laughs> All right, lab seven. Now you can read what I say, and then you can read between the lines for all the other stuff that I've said in class. All right, I want there to be a page for you to search for class by class title, so freeform text. A page will allow you to search for class by department, a list of valid departments. Make it so that on the search results, if you click the course title, you're taken to a page that shows you all the sections for the class. Well, first of all, I have more than one page, right? If I have more than one page, I want them to look consistent, right? If I want to ensure that my pages look consistent, I am going to develop a master page. And I'm going to put some CSS in it so it looks good. So, what would I expect? I'd expect to have a master page. And you could do this a number of ways. This is the way I would do it. All right? I'd have a home page. I'd have a by name search and by department search. All right. So I'd make on my master page I have a little navigation. Home by name by department. Now some people like added on to this to like lab six. I guess I don't have a problem with that. But still, if you have more than one page, have a navigation so I can find it. This is a website, you know. The assumption for all these is that they look like completed websites. And what kind of website would not have a navigation if it had more than one page? Okay, so you have at least these three things and you at least have a navigation. All right, now, by name, Text box, search, get a list of courses. By department, you have a drop down list of departments and you get a list of courses. Now, it said in the search results, and I would consider both of these pages as having search results. And this isn't just me splitting hairs. I, I want to I wanna teach something very specific here. I want it so that if you click on the course, you're taken to a list of all sections. Now, in the spirit of do not repeat yourself, it's probably one page, right? How are you going to get so that these two pages can each call the same page? just construct the link the same way. So if this page is expecting a course ID on the query string with the name class ID, I should say instead of course ID, then if you just create a URL that's expecting a class ID equal sign if you construct that URL on both these pages, then both of them can have links to this page. All right? 
and you're good to go. All right. So all three, all so you would have default by name, by department, and section list, all of which implemented the master page. There would be no reason to have the section page on the navigation, right? Because you have to select the course first. So you wouldn't have to put that in, as part of the navigation, but you'd have the other two pages there. All right? Uh, so when I was grading this, and I was grading it, I think, yesterday, or maybe the day before, it wasn't as though, how do I want to say this? It wasn't as though the stuff that I saw was, like, bad, you know? It was okay. It was, you know, it, it had a lot of stuff that was good, a lot of stuff that was right. But I just want a little more attention to detail, all right? To dot the I's, cross the T's. Make sure the database design is, is tight. Make sure that the database design is good. Make sure this acts like a application, simple application to be sure, but make sure if you gave it to someone, all right, it's not something earth shattering, but they'd be able to tell if they got to the home page what they need to do, and it would make sense to them. So, you know, there's a lot of implications to this, all right? For example, for sections, do I want to show a professor ID? No, because no one knows what those professor IDs mean, so therefore I need to join that to the professor table, all right? Make it look like something that would be useful that you could actually use in a case like this if you were looking for a class. All right, so it would be understandable and, and, and so on. So that was my experience in grading it. Not that, again, not that the stuff that I got was bad, but the stuff that I got, a lot of the stuff that I got, let's put it this way, it was a notch off. So let's just tighten it up and, and make it work. Now. Your design is due next week, all right, for your date for your project. Kind of surprising, huh? Yeah. All right, it is. I th even think I posted an announcement there, all right. I did make a lab eight assignment, but here's sort of the, here's sort of the order to, that I would like you to approach things. And again, Thursday is going to be a work day. So we're just going to go right to lab, provided it's available, which I'm pretty sure it is. If you are working on something pre-lab 8, obviously get that done. Like if you're working on lab, I'm sorry, if you're working on something pre-lab 7. I would expect most of you Thursday will be working on lab 7. So if you turn lab 7 in and it wasn't perfect, all right, full credit, what I mean by perfect, Full credit and no comments, all right? If it wasn't perfect, I would expect you to work on Lab 7. Of course, if you haven't turned in Lab 7, I would expect you to be working on the labs prior to Lab 7, probably Lab 6, in which case you could, you have a, you have a jump start on the database design, all right? So Lab 6 or Lab 7, depending on which one you have or have not turned in. If you are perfect on those two things, then work on your database pro uh, design project, your semester project. If you have got that done, don't come. Just don't come. yeah, I was going to say enjoy the nice weather if you want. Um, maybe look at um, Lab 8, but that should be, Lab 8 should be the least of your worries because I'm going to, I don't know what the due date is on that, but I'll extend that. I'd probably extend it by a week. All right? So, any questions? All right. See you later.